Okay. Good morning. Um, I'm Dr. Mikdelim Tombeni, a second year medical intern currently rotating in family medicine. Um, today we'll be talking about, um, or, or rather looking at the approach to compliance. So we'll start off with a case scenario. So this is Mrs. N, Ms. NN, a 30 year old female casual worker, um, a domestic worker and a vendor who lives in Petty with her two children, aged seven and nine years, and her mom who's a pensioner. She was seen in casualty at CMH two weeks ago. So um, she was brought in by relatives with a history of patient being sick at home, um, duration of almost a year. Um, with loss of weight of plus or minus 20 kgs, loss of appetite and fatigue. Patient reported a severe headaches, painful neck, difficulty swallowing and malaise. So the positive findings on physical exam were conjunctive, um, conjunctival pallor. She was mildly dehydrated with oral candidiasis, neck stiffness, pulse um, of 110 and word HP of 8.7. The BMI was 15.94. Continuing, um, the doctor assisted the patient ordered um, baseline bloods, which were FPC, CASP, CRP, CT4, and also a lumbar puncture was done. Later on, she was admitted to the medical ward for further management with a diagnosis of TB meningitis, anemia of chronic disease, esophageal um, candidiasis, malnutrition, and RVD stage four. So with her HIV uh, medical history in 2013, she was diagnosed with HIV and was started on treatment the same year with um, TDF, FTC, and efferents. She had good compliance and she was biologically suppressed until 2018 when her husband passed away in an MVA. So in 2019, she was diagnosed with virological failure and was started on regimen two with AZT, PTC, and Aluvia. So she took treatment on and off for like three months and then decided to stop it due to ongoing barriers, which were reported to the healthcare provider at the clinic, but no intervention was done in relation to that. So she just stopped it. So they also mentioned that she had completed TPT in 2016, and then there, were, there was no history of pap smear being, um, being done. Even on the lab track system, it was not big. So keeping that in mind, um, there's an article that um, was published on the 5th of September, 2019. So there was sort of like um, assessing the long-term adherence to antiretroviral um, therapy in South African adult patient. So in this um, study, so it was sort of like a re um, retrospective study done on long-term adherence analyzed over a period of five years from 2009 to 2014 in Durban KZN. And a total of 270 participants newly diagnosed with HIV and TB co-infection were selected. So adherence assessment was done using pharmacy pull count and viral load measurements six monthly. And then the median age that I was found was 34 years, 54.8% uh, of them were female, 60% were full or part-time employed, the third of the cohort had completed secondary school studies, and then more than half of the cohort had disclosed their status, maybe to their partners, to their families, but they had disclosed their status. And then the highest adherence noted in the first year and the mean adherence was equal to uh, more than 95% every year on art. And intensive pre-art counseling at the time and education sessions, ongoing adherence support programs, pill boxes and one daily regimen assisted in maintaining the adherence. So only 14 people out of the 270 were reported to be suboptimal. Nine people had adherence estimates in the 90 to 95% interval. And two people had like adherence in the 80 to 90, and then two people 70 to 80 and one person around 70%. So successful treatment outcomes on the first and second line regimens with 93% virologically suppressed. So it didn't matter whether a person was on um, on the first line, like maybe your FTZ or a person was on the second line, all of them were 93% were virologically suppressed. So now that we've um, seen the case scenario and that article, I want you um, to keep that in mind as we try to break down um, 
the whole thing. So now we're gonna sort of like get into compliance and adherence and just get definitions and so forth. So compliance is the act of complying with a wish, a request, a demand. Um, medicine, it's willingness to follow a prescribed course of treatment. Um, it's a disposition or tendency to yield to the will of others. Um, so it's a term used to describe how well a patient's behavior follows the medical advice, the process of adhering policies and decisions. The word compliance um, comes from the Latin word compere, uh, meaning to fill up and hence complete an action, transaction or process and to fulfill a promise. So now, um, compliance versus adherence, since there's a link between the two. With medical adherence, it's how well a patient adheres to a doctor's orders. Um, this is an action that the patient takes regarding their medication, like filling and refilling their prescription, the dosage recommendations, following the correct schedule and fulfilling the period of time that is needed for effective treatment and not messing up their um, follow-ups with the doctor or the pharmacy. Medical compliance now is more uh, passive action that involves the patient following the treatment program and taking their medicine routinely, following orders correctly, um, attempting to make lifestyle changes and utilizing medical um, devices or physical therapy at home. So with adherence, it's more sort of like a partnership. It's the healthcare provider and the patient, they sit together like, how can we do this together? Whereas compliance is more sort of like, you must take your treatment, you must come for reviews, you must um, report if there are side effects, you must come for your blood, all of that. So now, um, our chairs, we're not asking what is it um, in HIV treatment. So for people with HIV, treatment adherence means starting HIV treatment, mm -hmm. taking HIV medicines every day and exactly as prescribed, um, keeping all medical appointments. Adherence to treatment is key part of staying healthy with HIV. Oops, sorry. Now, what is now the importance of adherence? So we sort of wanna look at what happens when someone is non-adherent. Obviously, they're gonna have suboptimal drug levels, HIV, uh, HIV drug failure, HIV viral load rebound, HIV drug resistance, cross resistance to drugs in the same class, and then they'll end up transmitting that drug resistant virus. So what happens now when a patient is adherent? They have higher CD4 counts, there's no disease uh, progression, there's like more options in case there's a new study and they very suppressed, they can be put on um, upcoming um, medications that are coming out and it decreases cost as well because it's just one pill. They don't have to um, take multiple pills and have multiple follow-ups with the doctor. And there are factors that influence adherence. We looked at the patient's factors, medication, healthcare provider patient relationship, medical care and infrastructure. <clears throat> So with patients' factors, um, we look at the socio-demographic and the psychological. So starting with the socio-demographic, we look at the access to care. Um, I'm gonna use Eastern Cape as an example. It's, we know that it's one of the disadvantaged uh, um, provinces in the country. So you found that people living in the rural areas have to travel long distance to get um, care. Also the age of the patient, level of education matters like we, um, if you remember correctly from the, from the article we had, um, years on treatment um, of years on um, knowing your diagnosis and marital status as well. So with this one, you find that people are not taking treatment because you have not disclosed your status to your partner. So now you don't want to take it in front of them. So you're hiding and end up not taking treatment. So with psychological factors, mental health is important. If patients are depressed, if patients are psychotic, or maybe they are manic, I don't think they will be able to like take treatment. Involvement of substance use, main thing will be intoxication or withdrawal. They won't even be thinking about, I need to take my pills. Social support, um, people that are supported, if they forget, maybe someone will be like, oh, mama, you forgot you didn't take your pill today stigmatized. So this is common in the younger population, like um, 
teens and young adults. So it's where people now care about what people say. Um, they'll be like, okay, if I go to that clinic, people will know I'm getting treatment. If I go to that side of the hospital, they know I'm going to ARV, so I'm not going there. Um, knowledge of HIV and treatment. So a lot of the times, even though patients were told that they are HIV and they're gonna be on treatment forever, some of them, they don't really know how it works. Um, what is it that you have to take treatment every time, even though they told. Um, so with lacking that knowledge, you, you're not gonna know if you have to take your treatment every day. So forgetfulness every day, maybe deal with busy schedules, um, elderly patients with dementia or people who are mentally impaired tend to be forgetful medication factors so the amount of pills that need to be taken um influence side effects um, and other medication associated for example in this case you're going to include maybe if for example a patient's um, cd4 count is less than 200 now they have to be added to factrim they have to be on tpt all those things and you find that now with the maybe they're on second line they're on aluvia this dyslipidemia you have to add like statins as well then they have hypertension you add something for hypertension so that's like could be overwhelming for the patient then factors um healthcare provider patient relationship factors so openness and cooperation um if you open with your patient and the patient is um cooperative you know it's it improves adherence. Um, patients' view of healthcare provider competence. Some patients will look at you and be like, this person seems to not know what they're talking about. And then how am I supposed to trust them? And how am I supposed to take more pills when I ask them or tell them that the pill is making me feel like this? And then they still leave it like that. So I'm not going to continue. And also healthcare provider um, willingness to include patient in decision making. So now it includes review dates, bloods. Um, when they have to come back, like we ask, when is it suitable for you to come? And then maybe you can associate them. If a patient, a patient has to go maybe for eyes, they can come on the same day instead of coming for eyes this week, coming for HIV um, pills next week. So lack of negotiation and communication skills from the healthcare provider as well. Um, with medical care um, infrastructure factors, um, we look at privacy. Um, with public hospitals most of the time or public facilities sometimes you could find some a person like the healthcare provider will be maybe talking loudly the patient like feeling small like everyone is hearing my what what i have the treatment that i have or what 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 i did and also isolation of arv units so this is a bit of a um, controversial issue because some people prefer to be isolated where they know that it's only me going there to take my treatment no one sees me especially with our arv unit here it's like alone on the side and then ward five on the side but then some people now question like okay why do we have to come here only as hiv it's like are we not wanted are we not supposed to mix with other people so distance to healthcare facilities as well like i mentioned with the whole traveling and the transport availability so how do we then now measure adherence? So there are principal techniques in our settings that we use. Self-reporting. So the patient will come or they sit during the consultation and they'll be like, okay, I am taking my treatment. I'm taking it like this and like that and like that. Then that's how you know the patient says they are taking their treatment. So with pill counts, um, it helps you see the date issued and the pills left over. So the patient will be required to come with their pill to the hospital and like, okay, they were issued on this day. And then how many are left to go? And then this, if you're dealing with like patients who are truthful and reliable, obviously they'll tell you the truth. But if you're dealing with someone who'll be like, okay, I was supposed to take for five days, I didn't, let me take it, flush it to the toilet. So it, you'll never know. And pharmacy refill, um, this one is the most exposing. Um, is noted as patients come to collect their treatment. Patient given a script for six months and maybe they were given um, two months treatment to come collect it. And then you see that they only came once to collect it in the entire six months. So now how do we improve it? Um, we need a multidisciplinary team involvement. Um, you have to assess the patient's mental state. You screen for mental health illnesses and substances. 
extensive counseling and education um, on HIV, what is it, medication that they'll be on, their side effects. If patients are reporting side effects that are not going away, it's important to switch drugs um, that are giving them problems and put them on drugs that could give least side effects or side effects that won't be a problem to them. And also tell them how resistance develops. You know, if you're on and off your treatment, the virus will start getting creative and you will start um, getting resistant to the treatment that you're on. So we must plan review dates with patients and give dates suitable to them, you know. Ongoing lifestyle modification. You know, when you're on this treatment, you don't want to add on other things. Make sure you eat healthy, like you don't have to buy all these fancy things, whatever you have, eat healthy, try to work out, all those things and decrease the pill burden wherever possible. Um, if patients are on maybe second line or third line and they may be qualified to be on fixed dose combinations, they can be on that. And then emphasize adherence on F, um, every visit. So this is how, when you incorporate the five A's. You ask about the, um, the medication. How are you on treatment? Is there anything new that you'd like to report? And then advise them, you know, I sometimes forget to take my pills and um, because I have to go out and I'm like, okay, instead of not wanting to take your pill and maybe think you'll come back and take it later, how about take it before you leave? So that, you know, even though you forget, you knew you took it assess how they are, um, you know, the nutritional assessment, their mental health, how they are uh, generally, and then assist them. Like in, if the patient seems depressed or the patient seems um, malnourished, assist them like referring to other specialties as well where they can be seen and then arrange. So with arranging, now it's when you involve the patient more, you know, um, follow up dates, bloods, reviews, medication, everything else and make sure that they have a strong system support. Use of pill boxes, diaries or, or alarms or associating taking ARVs with activities that they usually do maybe at the certain time so that they don't forget. And most importantly, if patients are doing well, if patients are, they don't miss um, on their follow-ups, if they do, they usually let you know, or they send someone to come over. We must applaud them and encourage them. You know, like you're doing good, your viral load is down, it means you keep going so that they feel encouraged and motivated to keep going. And then why do patients default um, art? So sometimes it could be treatment fatigue. Patient has been on art for like 20 years and they see that it's like a, non, a never ending process and they decide, you know what, I'm just done, I'm tired. Patients could still be in denial. You know, they don't yet believe that they're HIV positive. So obviously they won't take their treatment. Major life events, maybe the passing of someone um, could lead to that. Um, depression or feeling overwhelmed with taking that treatment. Relocation, you know, having to move to a different place. And when you get there, when you try to collect it, like, okay, where are your papers? We can't give you treatment. Um, treatment side effects, um, forgetfulness, stigmatized, or remind of HIV infection. So some people, when they take ARV is sort of like a reminder, like, oh, you're HIV, that's why you have to take this. Oh, you're HIV. So I'm like, if I don't take it, then I won't get that reminder that I have this um, illness. So this is side effects. I'm not going to go through it. Um, as you can see there, the, on top there, there's a guy who looks a bit psychotic that could be ever effaberant. I'm not going to go through that. <laughs> and then returning to art, um, why do patients return? So patients return to taking treatment when they become sicker. Um, they see now it's going down, they have to come back and take their treatment. Influence from other people like, oh, someone told me, you know how news communicate, um, how news travel fast in the communities. Like someone also has this thing and they taking treatment. I can also do that. You know, they need to better their lives. Someone realizes on, all of a sudden that I have children that I have to take it. So it means I have to take care of myself. I have to take it, um, take my medication. And finally accepting the status. Okay, you know what? It is what it is. I'm doing this. And the fear, most people still associate HIV with death. Like if I have this, it means I'm gonna die. Uh-uh, let me take my treatment. 
So what to do now when this patient is here to like um, reinitiate, um, to take treatment again? So we have to investigate the reason for defaulting because we can do all these other things, take bloods, work them up, put them on the same regimen that they were on. But if we didn't get the reason for defaulting, a patient might still default. So we have to know that and um, take to consideration what they report as side effects, for example, and then full workup and multidisciplinary team has to be involved now. So um, with the workup, we have to identify the opportunistic um, infections and conditions requiring agent care. The pay, um, at the moment, the, pre, um, the patient presents. And the nutritional assessment, you have to screen for mental um, health issues or substance use for major chronic um, non-communicable illnesses, your hypertension, diabetes, epilepsies, for pregnancy or family planning, if it's someone maybe in their... Um, what's this reproductive age and maybe they want to have children in the nearest future or when then you have to take that into consideration as well. Screen for STIs, neurodevelopment in children and then stage our patients. Then with workup, um, initially when they come back, we will have to do a CD4 count, renal function with creatinine and EGFR, HB, HB, um, gene experts um, in those who qualify, those who, quali um, who have symptoms, um, cough symptoms that are screen positive for TB or all HIV um, positive pregnant women have to get a gene expert. Um, a hep B um, superficial um, antigen, a surface, sorry, hep B surface antigen and a pap smear in females. And then please note that other investigations obviously will depend on the patient when they present. If maybe a patient is presenting with jaundice and then they were not on any treatment, we will have to investigate that one, that one as well. And then please remember the medical indications to defer at. I'm not really going to go through them. This is just a reminder so that you have to take note of before putting them on art and make sure they are excluded. So this is the continuation of the medical indications to defer. So now, how do we then reinitiate art on treatment? Like, how do we then put them back after everything has been done, the workup? Now we know the reason why they defaulted. So we have to take history, like extensive history. We have to know which drugs the client was on and for how long and why they stop art. Did they have any side effects? And we have to know like information on viral loads. If it's not documented, we have our lab track. We have to see when and how was it. And then if the patient was clinically well on the regimen, we're gonna use TEE as an example here. Um, if they were well on the regimen, um, side effects were not the reason for them stopping art and viral load was suppressed. So you restart them on the same regimen on TEE. And then you do a viral load in three months. And then if they're, deep, um, they're suppressed, you can speak to your patient, you know, um, ask them if, okay, now that you're suppressed, can you switch you to dolitogravir, obviously. But then if it's still more than 15, then you have to repeat your viral load in six months. And then if it's still, uh, like if it's less than 50, you give them an option again. But if it's more than a thousand, that's when now you have to start thinking, am I switching this patient to second line regimen or third, depending what they were on. So, there are multiple factors that contribute to non adherence So we need a well-equipped team to attack these things. So you need your social workers on board, your psychologists, your dietitians, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, your support groups, physicians, nurses, and pharmacists to be on board. And then, um, this is exciting because this um, is an article, it's very short. It was uh, published on the 26th of September, like this year. So it's very, it's still very fresh. And they were looking at um, why do people um, default out? So like when they're living and then HIV gets in the way, what do they do? Um, so we found that in that study that reported that um, USAID's um, set a 1990 target to measure global progress by 2020. So we're in 2022 now. So for those who, who don't know, the first 90, so it's three 90s. The first 90 is 
90, by 2020, the goal was that by 2020, 90% of HIV positive patients have to know their status. And 90% of HIV positive people must be on art. And 90% of people that are HIV positive and are on art must be viral suppressed. So in South Africa, the first 90 is met and the second 90 falls short at 75 and it's still 2020. So this is, uh, it's 2022, sorry. So this is um, due to poor retention and health services noted to be the cause um, for this. And then it was also noted that the number of people reinitiating re art is as higher or higher than the people starting treatment for the first time. Now this is this is bad. So now the target for 2030 is 95, 95, 95. So I don't know where we currently at right now. So this study was done in three provinces of South Africa. They didn't mention which provinces and 56, uh, 562 people were surveyed. So they were given questionnaires and they were asking them questions. 30 of them reported that they were return, returning to art after interruption. So they also noted that retention in care was influenced by family, societal and care, um, health care service barriers. So with individualism, like looking at the patient and society, they noticed that mobility or relocation, um, side effects, feeling sick to continue and time limitation due to work were the most reported, followed by healthcare providers insisting on tra uh, transfer letters in order for them to issue treatment. So what then they, they, they think needs to be done. So they um, want functional information systems that can link medical records for people to collect treatment anywhere in the country um, must be implemented. So South Africa is a country where there's a lot of interprovincial movements. So a person must not be restricted where they can collect their treatment. And people should not be asked for transfer letters when they want to go collect their art. And we must improve literacy, um, treatment literacy that people understand. And longer treatment prescriptions. So apparently in 20, no, during COVID times, there were prescriptions that were up to 12 months. So it means that you only see patients once a year and then when they come for bloods, something like that. So they wanted that to be extended for people that are busy and know that they're reliable, they're taking their treatment, they're not problematic. And people on art need comprehensive support that covers medication related issues, psychosocial and also um, socioeconomic support. So in conclusion, um, supporting people living with HIV to stay on treatment is the biggest challenge that South Africa is currently facing. And needs and views of people on art must be heard and considered to protect and build on the health gains from the art program. And services that are flexible and accommodative of people's changing life circumstances will improve health and HIV transmission. So thank you, Dr. Yusini, for helping me with this presentation. Um, thank you, everyone. And these were my references. Thank you very much, Dr. Mtomeni. That was an excellent presentation on a very important topic. Um, I would like to add just a couple of more layers, um, especially around the brief behavioral counseling. So we will be posting at some point a little presentation on that, which is something one can use um, for um, any behavioral change, but just about the five A's. So you were looking at the five A's quite broadly, um, and I just would like to go through them just a little bit more specifically around an adherence counseling intervention. So for those of you who don't know brief behavioral counseling, it's a specific methodology that you can do in 10 or 15 minutes to help a patient change something small um, in their lives. So it's not about trying to make massive changes, but how do we move things on a little bit? And it's built around the five A's. Um, and as I say, I will send around a presentation specifically giving a lot more detail on that. So the first question is about ask. And for me, it's always a question on how do you ask people whether they are compliant? Because the challenge is, is we create an expectation that people are supposed to be 100% compliant, right? So when people come in, there's this thing of, well, how are you taking your treatment? And the feeling is, you're supposed to be taking your treatment 100%. 
And because we ask the question like that, patients feel that if they say they've missed treatment, that they're failing either themselves or us, or like they, it's not nice to say, oh, well, actually I'm not doing very well with taking my treatment. And so we actually set patients up by the way we ask the question. So the way you need to ask about adherence needs to be in a way that you make it safe for the patient to say, I'm missing tablets. So I always like to say to my patients, yo, it's very hard taking patient, you know, tablets every day. When I take antibiotics, I never even remember to finish the five days. You know, isn't it terribly difficult to remember to take your treatment every single day? Um, how many do you miss in a week? So you create an expectation that the patient is missing treatment and that that is okay. And I find there's very few patients, there's the odd patient will say, no, actually, I manage to take it every single day. Most patients will go, well, maybe I occasionally miss, or yeah, maybe I miss once or twice, or actually I miss the other weekend. And then that opens the conversation to now ask them, well, can we chat a little bit about that? Let's figure out what happened on those days that meant that you didn't take. So if you don't ask the question right in the beginning, you're suddenly in a problem because you're now thinking, well, the patient's lying to me because I can see the bar load is high. Um, and now the conversation gets difficult. So you've got to be, make it very safe right from the very beginning. So you ask the patient in the right way and you ask the patient whether you can chat to them about adherence. So you don't want them to feel like you're just the principal coming in as the bad guy. When you come to advice, you now want to be able to advise them to have better adherence and you want to link it directly to a problem they have in their lives. So you don't want to make it um, abstract. You want to say to them, listen, I notice you're getting a lot of rashes or you know all these funny pimples you have on your skin at the moment. This is because your viral load is very high. We can get that viral load down if we're able to help you take your treatment every single day. So when you give advice around a change, you want to link that advice directly to something that's happening in their lives at that time that they might want to have better. So you want to help sort of link it into where they're at and every time you um, give advice on something or maybe give a suggestion, you always then want to ask the patient, well, what do you think about that? Or how do you feel about that? Or how did that, how do you, how do you, have you thought about that before? When we talk about assess within this context, we mean we're now trying to assess how ready is my patient to start making this change? When you have these patients who's been on second line and every single time you see them, the bio load is always high. So they've already failed on first line. Now they're coming in on second line, it's always high. Obviously we've never sorted out the issue why they failed on first line in the first place. Um, and so you need to try and figure out, well, how ready are they to actually now make a change to get to the point where they're taking their treatment every day? Um, and then two classic motivational intervention questions is to say to them, out of a scale of one to 10, how ready do you feel to make this change now? How ready do you feel to get to taking treatment every day? And then the second question is, how able do you think you're going to be able to do it? How easy or how difficult is it for you? Do you think you're going to manage? And again, you can ask them to score it out of one to 10. So now you can start getting an idea where my patient is at in terms of this change I'm wanting them to make. Assist is obviously now helping them to come up with some ideas on how they're going to do it. And it's very helpful to get very practical. I don't know if Generations still slow, because nobody watches SABC anymore, but in the old days, we used to say to them, you know, when you watch Generations, remember that's when you take your tablet, or everybody's got cell phones these days, so you can put an alarm or something on it. So start looking at suggestions on, on how you can make it practical. For example, with second line, um, quite often being able to reassure patients that they don't have to take treatment strictly to at exactly the same times in the morning and evening. So sometimes years ago, we used to say to patients, you have to take it at eight and eight or seven and seven, and then they miss, or they're gonna go out and then they just don't take their tablets. So looking at, well, it's fine if you don't always take it at the same times, reassuring our patients that they can drink with alcohol, drink, drink with alcohol, hear me, drink with, um, with ARVs. Obviously we want to help our patients to drink less, but if you're gonna ask your patients to choose between alcohol and taking their tablets, they're going to choose the alcohol. They can't have a lifetime of now suddenly being sober just to take their ARVs. So you have to be able to say to them, if you're gonna go out on Friday night and you're gonna go out drinking and you're going off to the Shabins at five, take your treatment before you go out. It's not a problem. And then the other myth as well that's out there is that people think they have to take the treatment with food. 
and to be able to reassure them this kind of treatment, um, it doesn't matter if you take it on an empty or a full stomach. As a matter of fact, some of the ARVs is even better on an empty stomach. So those are little, so in the assistant part, we actually want to give them lots of information then, and you want to work with your patient. And this is when you try and help them to set a very small goal that they set. This is what, what I want to try and do, and this is why it's important to me. And then arrange is now arranging your next follow-up date, arranging what we're going to check when you come next time, arranging when your blood tests are going to happen, and also giving them a safety net. You know, if something happens and you don't end up coming for your appointment, sometimes people feel bad because they've missed an appointment or they've missed a week. Just come as soon as you can. It's fine. And also to then not give them too much of a hard time when they, when they do come back, you know, being a rather sympathetic, oh, what happened? Let's learn from this. So it's all about how we make it safe enough for our patients. Um, and if we're in a dynamic where the patients are lying to us and not telling us the whole story, we actually have to reflect on ourselves. Are we actually creating a safe enough space that our patients can tell us about, about that? So that's a very brief, brief behavioral counseling training. Um, and I will send you the more uh, detailed one. And then I just also wanted to add another layer to this slide. So this slide is from the 2019-2020 ARV guidelines and was specifically focusing on that. At that time, most of our patients were still on TEE. So they were on efavirenz-based regimens, and this was all about how we're going to change our patients from TE to TLD. We're now actually in quite a different environment, and a lot of our patients are now on TLD. And we also obviously see a lot of patients who default on second-line treatment. So very importantly, when somebody defaults on an efavirenz-based regimen, it means that they've got, they get resistance to that regimen very, very quickly. And that is why we want to figure out very, very quickly if they are on the right regimen. So that is why when you restart somebody on TEE, you will do that via load within three months. Because if that via load is not suppressing, we know the regimen is not working and we need to start them onto second line as soon as possible. The dynamic changes considerably if somebody's on TLD or on a lupinavir ritonavir based regimen. So to be able to fail on a lupinavir ritonavir based regimen or a dolitegavir based regimen takes at least two years. And we would wait for somebody to have failed on that treatment for at least two years before we're even going to do a genotype. So I know it's very satisfying to do a viral load at three months, but in the reality is we'll probably be doing viral loads every six months on second line or dolitegavir for at least two years before we're gonna start genotyping. And so although it's very nice to do a viral load because it helps us to see whether our patient is now adherent to treatment, it's a very expensive way to test for adherence. And so with lupinavir, ritonavir, and dolitegavir, we would normally do the viral load if they're, if they're failing every six months. And then at two years, or if there's other reasons why we might suspect resistance, then obviously you will do a genotype um, at that time. So those are just two slightly more complicated layers that, that I wanted to add. Um, I would like to now open the, the, the floor for discussion and we'll start off with anybody here from, from the room. For those of you that are online, please put your questions in the chat or put your name up and I'll give you an opportunity um, to bring your questions. <laughs> Sorry, we're just organizing the microphone. There we go. Yeah. Thank you very much for the presentation. I think that the process of adherence has been a, a critical thing in our HIV program for a long time. And remember that the good adherence means that if we are able to keep the viral loss suppressed for life and failing to do that is going to impact negatively in the life of the patient and also in our health system. And we say that in our patient because this one is going to increase the morbidity and mortality of our patients, is going to also increase the pill burden and more possible side effects. And when we go to the health system, it's going to increase the rate of admission with AIDS defining condition, complexities of the regimen, you need to monitor more closely with our patients, et cetera. So the biggest challenge that I think that we have in our setting here at CMH, for example, number one is that we are 
not able to trace all of the people who defaulted treatment. And the reason for that is that the people change the cell phone, change the address. So what we are doing currently is try to update all of the personal details of the patient every time that they are coming to our clinic. Second things, I noticed that since we started the UTT for our patient, we are very excited to put everybody on treatment and we don't spend too much time in the process of counseling our patient. So we know that at the primary health care, there is a long queue and sometimes short of the staff of staff, but remember this one is an ongoing process. You don't need to finish everything in the first consultation. And the last thing is that the a patient present to our unit very sick without transfer later, and the patient has no clue sometimes about the prior ARBC exposure. So I think that one of the recommendations that was done in the last article that the doctor present is going to be wonderful. If we can have a national system that link the tier.net. So in that way, whatever the patient present without any information, we are able to trace the trace, okay? The history of, of our patient. Thank you. Thank you very much, doc. Um, I don't see any questions on the chat yet. Um, anybody else from the room here would like to come and contribute? Madeleine, it's, it's Jenny, if you've got a moment. Sorry, just say that again, Dr. Dabka. It's Jenny, I'll come after uh, her. Sorry. Okay, great. No problem. Dr. Mohamed is going to speak and then I'll give you a chance. Hi, I just wanted to mention about promoting independence and empowerment of individuals via health literacy. So according to the Shanghai Declaration from the World Health Organization, there are three tiers to uh, health literacy. And the first one being influential health literacy, which is more community based. So media, radio, uh, information that the, patient, the patients are getting from other sources. The second was engaged health literacy, which is with us as healthcare providers. And thirdly, it's core health literacy, where we've empowered patients to actually look it up for themselves. So this is an ongoing process. And I think it's an important one to point out that information to the patients is, it should come from the national level and the community-based level. So once they get to us, they have this willingness to want to uh, seek more information about their condition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Jarka, please go ahead. Just unmute yourself. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Team uh, CMH, for this presentation. I just wanted to raise three things. One is, is when the doctor said uh, in the study that was done that uh, transfer letters and such things delay patients and would like to talk to us colleagues that could we move to the electronic system? I'm happy I've spoken before, Jenny. Maybe she can tell us as to how far are we with the regis patient registration system where all patients would be registered so that we can actually get the information of a patient electronically so that we then don't have those kinds of delays that you don't have a transfer letter, therefore I cannot give you medication because NHLS has actually made it a little bit easier for us because I'm assuming then, because I'm not on, on the platform, that it is now easier for, for doctors or clinicians to get results of patients just on a press of a button. It would be nicer if also this patient registration system could kick on so that we are also able to pick up patients and their treatment, where they were treated and, and what were the issues rather than depend on them because we do know that when they have defaulted they know and they will tend to to hide that information the second point i want to raise is is, is, a, is an issue of pill fatigue we started this program in, in in 2003 2004 and about then now i mean those patients are close to 20 years on treatment and to really expect as them to, 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 to be as adherent as we would love them without support is, is, is really a dream. And, and also, I'd like also, Janet, just to give us a view of what is the status of those patients that initiated treatment then? Do we have a system where we're able to track them in the cohorts to say the cohort of 
2005 is here, the court of 2007 is, is, is looking like this. And if not, could we maybe have a way of creating that system? My last point is adherence uh, uh, for children and adolescents. This is a very difficult one. And uh, <clears throat> there are adherence guidelines for children that tell you what is it that you need to say to a seven-year-old or a 10-year-old. And the most difficult group being the adolescents. So we are really wanting to create systems where we start disclosing to these children so once they are still young, they may not understand what the disease is. I know that booklet has means and ways of saying, how do you tell a seven year old so that they just know that they have this treatment that they must take for life, it's gonna keep them uh, alive for this long. But then when they are adolescents, it hits them hard because now all of a sudden they get to understand that they got HIV from their parents and now this HIV is putting their own uh, um, love life in, in, into a thread because they must always disclose or they must always do this. So I think we are as a country at that stage where we should also be looking at such issues so that we start, we start uh, strengthening those, those, those areas because we are picking up a lot of teenage pregnancies and now one wonders if there's so many of them who are getting pregnant, how many of them would have been PMT city babies who would, who would have picked up HIV at, 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 at PMT city stage? And do we have enough programs? I mean, I know I'm talking to you, CMH, you are at tertiary, this is not for you. This is for us at primary care level where we need to be having this. We used to have support groups in my time and such issues where uh, these young people can have an environment where they can discuss. I know. Dr. Brunet Frey used to have clinics for them where they would sit and discuss their issues. It's area that I'm just raising to us uh, to, to strengthen. Thank you very much. Over to you, Jane. Thank you very much, Dr. Jay. Yes, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Nashit on the administrative. Um, I just wanted to add a couple of points around the children and the teenagers. Thank you for bringing those up. Um, just to be aware, there is a new preparation out for Lipinova Ritonova. And it is coming or might already even be available. It'd be nice to hear from the clinics if they have access to it, because we all know that the old Kalitra liquid is extraordinarily bitter. So we're asking two, three-year-olds to drink the most horrendous substance on earth twice a day. Um, and they've now created small little pellets that you mix with porridge on a spoon and, and swallow down. And very important that we become aware of better preparations to make adherence easier for our children. And then with the adolescents, um, especially with the new uh, research out from the Nadia trials, we really need to look with adolescents where the TLD is not an option, even those failing on second line. And those can be discussed with infectious disease consultants. I know the guidelines have not yet been changed um, and we can't yet roll out all the changes at this point, but certainly in those high risk, you know, you know 15, 16 year olds failing on a, on a second line regimen with lupinavir, ritonavir, uh, TLD might actually be an option. And to be able to discuss that with a specialist to see if we can make those teenagers adherence a little bit easier. Um, I'm going to hand over to, to Dr. Nash. And good morning. <clears throat> good morning, colleagues. Thanks for a great presentation. Um, so just <clears throat> yeah, I just wanted to <clears throat> sorry, I just wanted to make a, a few comments. Um, so I think you know, with the adherence issues. We often find that people are writing vitamins and all kinds of other <clears throat> medicines. And I think what, you know, the comments have been made about the pool burden. We really need to keep medicines just down to the essentials. It's, it's obviously different if someone comes in and they've got an acute illness um, or, you know, they need antibiotics or they need some maybe vitamins for something. But I think we need to try. We often prescribe for our own good, our own feeling. And so I think we need to make sure we really try and streamline um, medicines right down just to the essentials, especially in young in young people. Um, and you know, the evidence shows that vitamins generally are, are not needed unless you've got a, you know an acute um, illness or something else specific, you know, like anemia or something. Um, and then just touching on the HPRS, so the HPRS system is the registration system at primary healthcare level. At the moment, we are registering patients, but at the moment, it's not. It's not visible if a patient is registered, for example, in KZN, and then they come to us or if they're registered in another facility. Um, we aren't able to pick that up on the HPRS. Um, it is being developed, and I think that that visibility will, in, in, that's the, the, the aim, that we'll be able to then, as soon as you put the ID number in, um, all of that information from another district or another facility will come up 
um, on HPRS, but at the moment that's not um, not yet there. So it's true, we do have to then, you know, go into track lab, see perhaps if there's some viral loads, but you won't get the information about the, the actual drug. So I think that is a um, that is a gap at the moment. In in terms of the, like the cohorts, the guys have been, you know, on treatment, you know, since the 2004 and five and things like that. Um, I think there's 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 good evidence of that that those patients have done very well. And um, many of them, for example, have got buffalo humps because they used to use Stavudine and they went on to AZT, et cetera. But I don't think there's there's any evidence to show that people who have been on treatment for a long time um, have any um, worse outcomes. I think it's the same as dealing with any chronic condition. So your hypertensives and your diabetics, et cetera, we need to be looking at how to support patients on chronic medications. Um, and I think that's the, <clears throat> that's the sort of topic. But certainly the, the patients I have in my facilities that I've been watching for 15 years, they've done um, very, yeah, very well. I think my plea to, you know, to district hospitals is that when nurses refer patients um, to a district hospital and there's been evidence that they're failing or they struggle, I, I think the district hospitals need to actually really wrestle the issue. I was sitting in the OPD the other day in a hospital and, and watching some of the patients come through and, and was talking to someone who was working there and said, you know, what are you going to do with this patient? They said, I'm going to, you know, carry on doing adherence counseling or I'm going to carry on taking blood or something. We really need to change these patients who are failing and the patients who come in um, who have got you know, viral loads of log five and six um, on alluvia, those patients must not have a resistance test. Those patients are not taking their treatment. And I think as has been clearly said, patients flush you know, tablets down the drain and the toilet, et cetera, because um, they, want, they want to be, please us. And so I think we need to be switching onto the atazanavir, ritonavir much, much quicker. It's now it's a single tablet, it's available at our clinics. Um, it's a wonderful alternative to alluvia. And you can say to the patient, um, you know, I, I'm very excited. I've got this new tablet for you. And you can then change them from the alluvia. So I think we, we underestimate how many people struggle um, with the uh, um, alluvia tablets. And then just, just a reminder with the, uh, Dr. Miller mentioned about the pellets. The pellets um, for the Kalito are actually really um, tedious to use. Um, and so it's really not, it, it, it sounded nice, but it's not always such a good solution. I think we're moving to the, the four-in-one syrup. Um, which has got the Abacavir, 3TC, Lepinavir, Rotonavir, strawberry flavored. Um, it's just come into the country and we're hoping to be able to get that quite soon. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to um, yeah, use, that, use that quite soon. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jenny. Wow, that's very exciting. I'm very happy to hear it because we need good preparations for, for, those, for those under three-year-olds. Um, I'm just checking there's no more now names up. I'm going to give the last word to Dr. Adene, um, who's just joining us, and then, and then we'll close off the meeting. Please remember to put your name and your professional details and your MP numbers or your professional numbers in the chat for us as an attendance register, even if you have registered. It's just helped to prove um, who was actually in the meeting, and I'm handing over to Dr. Adene. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks, to the team, for the excellent presentation. I think the preparation and the depth of the discussion was quite very good. And I think you, do, you know, we'll probably give you a full commendation after the uh, the session. The I think the the word compliance actually sounds paternalistic, and I think that's the first thing we need to get out of the way. We should rather stick to adherence for for purpose of you know changing practice. Then uh, I think uh, the comment of Dr. Jaksa, I think is equally very welcome. Uh, it's one of the key areas of research, operational research that are very, very useful, looking at the outcomes of care for those patients who have been on ARVs for more than 10 years. And we can actually look at uh, sampling specific facilities to look at a large cohort and see how many of those patients are still in care and the implication of uh, uh, side effects uh, profile in terms of what has happened to our patients. But in for, for purpose of our students as well who are listening, the five dimensions of adherence, which you highlighted four of those, those patient factor or healthcare for practitioner or healthcare worker uh, facility related factor, medication or therapy related factor, 
and socioeconomic factor, which again is a major problem. I'm coming back to I like to speak on that. But critically, disease-related factor was not part of the uh, your slide. That is again very important because at every point in time, disease itself, whether related to HIV or not necessarily related to HIV in a patient, could be a reason for poor compliance or poor adherence. You, you, we always say uh, our students should examine the amount of patients. If you've got extensive oropharyngeal candidiasis or esophageal candidiasis, and you have the all sort of ulcers, histoplasmosis, CMV ulcers in the mouth, you can swallow it. And uh, Kaposi sarcoma is a big factor of that, which, which is a problem. So examining our patients and actually looking at the patient holistically could be one of the reasons. And these are amenable to care for majority of these conditions. So we must never ignore that. But again, the aspect of socioeconomic factors is a major problem. Back in the time when I used to sit in uh, ERV clinic, a lot of the patient will tell you, doc, I don't have any food, that there's no food to eat. And I don't think the situation has changed. And even now, with the increasing cost of living, which is scary, even though those who are earning money, uh, salary, it's making one factor. I, I, I don't know what our managers can play about this. Then the infrastructural component, uh, 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 we had the privilege of visiting uh, some uh, CHCs yesterday. Uh, myself and Dr. Carroll. It's shocking how patients may not want to visit some of the cases. Often than not, when we sit in our comfort here in CMH, we may be, we may not be in true, you know, we may not have the true picture of what's happening out there. In fact, we practically see two, three tables of doctors around the same table. Not every patient will be comfortable to sit and consult about HIV-related problem within the, that kind of setting. And I think these are managerial or structural issues that may impact on adherence. But the other thing that largely academic, you, you know, when you look at adherence, there are different categories. You have patients who never really start treatment. You issue a script, they don't collect, you know, what we call primary non-adherence. Very important for us to have those, understand those. And of course, equally being named as non-fulfillment adherence. And you have the secondary non-adherence. These are again, different categories, you know, um, it will include those non-persistence, uh, non-adherence or non-conforming adherence. These are patients, you see patients, especially patients who are, who are diagnosed as inpatients. Often than not, when they are treated either for pneumonia and are discharged, and they are initiated on ARVs without adequate preparation of the patient. Often than not, they think once they complete the first month of treatment, everything is fine. Those are non-persistence, uh, 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 non-adherence, in which case there's a failure of uh, communication uh, uh, between of communication breakdown between the network and the and the patients, and we see we've seen a few of those patients who are initiated after they complete the month of treatment, they simply stop. And I think we need to be able to trace, have a, improve our systems to be able to identify those patients and link them to tier dot uh, uh, to be play, registered on tier dot net before they are discharged from the hospital. Otherwise, they will develop, they will fall into the category of non-persistence, uh, non-adherence. And of course, the very poor, large bulk of our patients are those defaulters or what we call non-conforming adherence, uh, non-adherence uh, patients. And of course, without us actually understanding the underlying etiology or the reasons behind uh, not compliant, uh, not adhering to treatment in patients, we truly may not be able to help those patients. So we, as part of our intervention, we need to actually get to the call because that will vary from one patient to the other uh, as they do in our consultation. And I think for me, what would then stand out is from all the lessons we are learning in caring for patients with HIV, we, it's about time now we start applying those lessons to other non-communicable diseases because we are keeping our patients uh, 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 for some reason, the number of uh, HIV-related mortalities have decreased tremendously due to these ARVs that are available and uh, with better profile of side effects. But critically, non-communicable diseases are creeping in 
there is increasing number of hypertension diabetes in these patients who are living with HIV. And therefore, whether we like it or not, we will still have to increase the pill burden because of the non-communicable diseases. And therefore, we need to be applying all of these lessons on non adherent of our managing with adherence in HIV to other non-communicable diseases. Thanks very much and a very good presentation. Thank you very much, everybody. I don't see any other questions in the chat or um, any other hands up. So um, I'm very happy to close this meeting. Thank you very much for joining us. We will do our next one again on the last Friday um, of the month. So there is, um, so that we'll see you again at the end of October. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a lovely Friday. <laughs>